Good morning. Yeah, so, uh, uh, things. So I want to talk about history. I like history because there are people older than me in our industry, and some of them, you yeah. um, But I want to start just to mess with your head and wake you up. So I don't know what you're really expecting, but... And then it gets weird. <laughs> Wait for it. It's hard to see in this size, but if you watch, these bridges float. These bridges are floating bridges. That's how you tune. Obviously, she bends the strings by twitching the other side. This is a, uh, a young Korean woman named Luna Lee. She's actually in the US these days on a, a work visa. Uh, this is a traditional Korean instrument called the Gagayam. I'm not sure the proper pronunciation. Uh, she restrings them with lighter strings, Western tuning, and plays heavy metal, uh, classic rock, uh, some blues and folk stuff. She's got hundreds of videos on YouTube. She is amazing. Uh, she has a very elfin voice. A lot of her vocals don't work for me, but some of them are just amazing. Um, she does a version of Landslide that's completely her own. And uh, anyway, she's cool. Luna Lee, L-U-N-A-L-E-E. -E. Um, I just thought I'd mess your head, show you a little something, wake you up, little, uh, I mean, a little skinner in the morning anyway. So um, <clears throat> we'll go there. Um, but first, hey, uh, anybody here first time coming to a conference, first hacker con of things? Cool, welcome. Um, we've chatted, if we haven't chatted, my name's Jack, I don't know anything anymore, uh, but I know people. So um, don't be shy, reach out if you, uh, reach out if you need connections, need information, don't be shy, make friends. That's what we need to do here build this local community. When we build this community, it strengthens the global community. Some of you are from far-flung places. We connect and it makes the world a better place. Um, the other one, I do separate talks on this. I'm not going to do it now, but um, hey, we have some issues. Uh, the political climate and social climate is uh, challenging, uh, to say the least. Um, we have a crisis of mental health in the U.S. because we still pretend mental health isn't a problem. Um, we have crises of PTSD and CPTSD. We have crises of uh, all sorts of things. Um, take care of yourself. And once you've taken care of yourself, take care of others. And don't be an amateur caregiver unless you're up to it because um, I see a therapist every week when I'm home because I play amateur caregiver and I love it. I love this community, I love this crowd. Um, but if you put yourself out too much, you end up spending quality time. Professional therapists are required by their license and uh, whatever to see another therapist to take care of themselves. Don't go too deep, but if you don't have to, to like text a friend and say, hey, you seemed awfully quiet at Hack Miami. How you doing? That's it. Um, don't, don't try to be a professional, but take care of each other. And like it says on the airplane, safety card, put on your own mask before helping others. If you're not in a good place, it's okay. Um, it's okay to admit it, ask for help. If you don't want to ask for formal help, there are people like me who you can chat to, vent to, cry to, yell at, scream at, as long as we arrange it. Uh, you know, it's like, I'm gonna call and I'm gonna tell you you're a horrible person and I'm just venting because my boyfriend's an asshole. And it's like, well, okay, as long as you've told me up front, now you can call and yell at me. Um, because uh, I don't know if you guys have noticed this, those of us that are trying to make the world safer in, in the computer realm, the odds are kind of against us. <laughs> um, so you add that to fucking modern life. Uh, so anyway, that's enough like being preachy and kumbaya bullshit. Um, so anyway, <laughs> past, present, and future of InfoSec. Um, first, 
back to the earlier point, um, we know more than you or me. Um, I have a highly complex timeline. We're going to take some time to, to break through the timeline and, and make it make sense. So don't be overwhelmed when you first see this timeline. We're going to try to make it make sense. But it really focuses on two things, um, technology, computers, and people. Um, so don't be overwhelmed by this. But here's the timeline we're going to work on this morning. <laughs> um, <coughs> so once we had... Um, fairly simple systems that were single user, single process, it was possible to secure them. We didn't, but it was theoretically possible. Um, uh, really? Uh, stupid technology. Practical presentation. Uh, uh, there we go, that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make this legible. Um, Anyway, we didn't have security. We started in the right direction. For those old enough who have studied history, BBN made this thing called 10X, which was supposed to be a, a secure operating system. It was kind of hysterically bad in retrospect. Um, but things started to get more complex. Multi-user, multi-processes, and then people did insane shit. Like they put terminals in the next room, not just in the room with a computer. Um, you know, and then it, it's just been uphill or downhill um, ever since. Uh, some people would argue that it looks more like this, um, which, uh, as, an, as a cynical old person, I fall into this regularly. Um, we'll talk about that later. There's, there's some truth to this. Um, speaking of cynicism, um, one of my favorite George Carlin quotes out of many great things he said was, inside every cynic is a disappointed idealist. That may ring true for some of you who've been in this business for any length of time. Um, but don't give up. So first, why are we going to start by looking back? Uh, well, because I'm old and I feel better in the past. Um, <laughs> because we have a past that we don't really understand. Um, and when you um, join the field of technology, particularly in security, we just run to try to keep up. And if you're honest with the way things are going now, you run to fall behind slowly. Um, <laughs> so we don't have time to look back. Um, so, you know, that's where it starts. So I, let's, let's take uh, 45 minutes or so, actually just about 10 or 15 minutes to look back here. But, um, you know, things were different in those days. Why do we not know these folks? Well, it was part of what you did. Security wasn't a specialty. It was just part of what you did in securing things. Um, there were other things. Like, uh, it turns out that there was security stuff before there was an internet. There was security stuff before there was a Google to index it, or Bing to not be able to find anything for you. Um, uh, so, you know, it, we've got silos. I'm sure none of you have experienced this, where you have stratification within your own organization from top to bottom. People don't talk to each other well, and then people in, that are trying to secure their own organizations don't talk to those of us in Vendorland who don't speak to people in higher ed. And then the people in government, uh, a lot of people that haven't dealt with them think that's a big monolith. It's like, no, military is different from civilian side of government. And once you get into intelligence and military and civilian, that's very different than law enforcement. So we have a lot of silos. So there's a bunch of information that, uh, that we don't see. Um, also, they have their own, you know, there are other conferences. Not everybody's on the same con circuit we are. Some of these people are different uh, things. We don't see a lot of uh, foundational figures. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously some of the, the older folks in the industry um, have passed away. Um, they've, you know, retired. They've gone away. And for some, you know, the, the less fortunate among them, they've moved into management, the poor bastards. <coughs> so we're going to start with uh, taking a quick look at some of the people and ideas, and then we'll bring it forward. So this one's just a sentimental favorite. Becky Bass, we lost her a little over a year ago. One of the most amazing people in the world. Did anybody know Becky? Okay, a little bit. Uh, she was truly amazing. Um, it's amazing how few people know of Becky. Uh, she had the, she earned the nickname Den Mother of Intrusion Detection when she was at NSA. She s mentored and provided financial and uh, logistical support to pretty much anybody that was involved in early intrusion detection and network analysis. 
So those of us that work in the industry, um, folks like Ron Gula, uh, Marty Resch, Marcus Ranum, John Flowers, uh, Rob Graham, anybody that was doing early network analysis stuff uh, benefited from Becky's mentorship. Um, she caught me a few years ago using that old nickname and I heard a lot of shit for it and she said, I want to be known as the Cranky Broad. I deserve it now. And I said, yes, ma'am. Um, great hugs. Uh, she was known as Info Mom to most folks. She mentored more people than is humanly possible to mentor. Uh, we lost her a little over a year ago. Um, pretty amazing woman. She, her dad came home from World War II with his bride from the other side of the Pacific. She grew up in South Alabama. Uh, so a woman of color with health issues uh, rose to uh, an amazing role inside NSA and then later consultancy. So she, she, she overcame some hurdles. Um, and uh, if, you want, if you feel like getting teary, if you uh, Google her or ask me, I'll find you the link to the, the, her former consulting website. Her business partner, Terry, collected a whole bunch of uh, memorials uh, to Becky. And uh, yeah. Yeah, be hydrated because your eyes are going to leak when you read some of them because the number of lives she touched was amazing. Gave the best hugs in the world. When she moved north to, uh, as her father put it, get, get a government job and marry a damn Yankee, uh, dad said, hey, when you're done with that, come home to South Alabama because we need some help down here. She ended her career and ended her life at the University of South Alabama, not the Roll Tide folks, but South Alabama. Um, because she promised her dad she would and set up a cybersecurity uh, unit there in their scholarships. A truly amazing woman. We've lost her. Those of us whose lives were touched by her, oh, uh, she left us some homework, and our homework is to be good to all of you and those that come afterwards. Uh, Becky's amazing, was amazing, best hugs in the world. Um, but let's get more into it. So we're at, we're at Hack Miami, arguably the first modern hacker, Neville Maskelin. He was a Victorian era gentleman, a dandy, as you can tell from that outfit. Um, he was a magician, an inventor, and a hacker. He invented the pay toilet. Um, it's like, there's, there's something. Uh, but working yeah, <laughs> yeah, no. um, In 1903, Marconi was demonstrating his wireless telegraph and told people it was secure. <laughs> Guess how that worked out. So if you've ever done Morse code stuff, you know that once you start reading the code, you don't process it. You just pass it eyes and then you say the words or scribble it down without actually thinking about what you're doing. You just become a conduit for it. So he did a man in the middle and his messages got to the receiver first in a parlor in London where he was trying to get money from investors to invest in his secure wireless telegraph, the audience realized that it probably wasn't the real message because he injected a obscene limerick about Marconi. And <laughs> uh, yeah, 1903, turns out, secure wireless and man in the middle were a thing uh, back then. Uh, other famous person, of course, everybody knows Alan Turing. Um, okay, uh, maybe. All right, so there's the real Alan Turing, um, you know. <laughs> but uh, everybody knows that, you know, this is why we have computers. He invented the computer. He's one of the many that did. But he, he actually designed, invented ideas. Very few people know this dude, uh, Doc Keen. Uh, he was called, nickname was Doc because he carried a doctor's bag, a leather doctor's bag. All of his tools were in it. He was a British engineer who worked at Bletchley Park uh, during the war. And he's the one that had to take the brilliant madman's ideas and turn them into something that somebody could actually build. I'm sure none of you have ever worked in a situation where there was somebody brilliant who couldn't exit them or whatever, uh, and you had to convert their messages, their ideas into reality. Um, and then he did some of the work, but he had to have a team of mechanics and engineers uh, that actually assembled pieces and soldered bits together. The point is, there are a lot, it takes a lot of people, um, and for you know, a lot of us, we're, we're the engineer or the mechanic or the electrician that makes stuff work. And uh, you know, not everybody gets, uh, uh, it takes all of us to make it work, I guess is what I'm saying. So he oversaw the, um, the building of the bomb, the bomba. Um, 
Three folks you probably don't know though, and they're really critical in the reason we know this dude, um, and the reason we needed this dude is Henrik Zagalski and these little Zagalski sheets, paper cards, and his partners, Jerzy uh, Rzyski and Marian Rzyski. I'm mangling the names, I'm sure. Uh, these are three, were three Polish mathematicians um, and cryptologists. They broke the Enigma code in the late 30s using paper. The three of them worked together. Uh, Henrik came up with this thing. They broke the Enigma code. Um, that's why the Germans made a better Enigma machine, which required a computer to break it. These people did the foundational work, and some of that work actually kind of looks like some of the work that the, the women of Bletchley Park that were hand code breaking before the computer um, came out of this work. These are people that are unsung. Uh, long term, it didn't work out so well for Poland, for those that know history, but um, it, uh, it's an interesting thing. It was this, this spy versus spy game. We had to, you know, they broke the codes, the Germans upped it, Turing gave us computers and in the process of breaking it. Um, it's an interesting challenge. Uh, oh, the, the, one of the things that is often overlooked if you haven't really seen the history is that the computer, the, the Bomba was not strong enough to break German Enigma codes. It was not actually capable of cracking the codes in a rational time until one of the women who did it by hand pointed out that um, they tended to sign off with the same sign off depending on who they were. And they were able to grab a chunk of plain text and seed the computers with a little bit of plain text. And then it was hours, not years, to start breaking things. And it's, once they did that, uh, it was over for the secrecy of the code. Um, if you've seen the movie about Turing, it, they take some liberties, but it's actually pretty good. Um, so uh, I'm not a good futurist, but there's this dude who was pretty good as a futurist. The computer will touch men everywhere and in every way, almost on a minute to minute basis. Every man will communicate through a computer, whatever he does, it will change and reshape his life, modify his career, force him to accept a life of continuous change. Now there are people that don't believe we're there with computers yet, they're wrong. If you had told people that 10 years ago, a lot of people wouldn't have bought it that deep. If you had told people that 20 years ago, when a lot of us were starting to get into this computer nonsense, people would have thought that's nonsense. Um, Willis Ware told us this in 1966. He saw where we were headed. Uh, amazing guy, he's been gone a few years, but he was made it into his 90s. Um, he spent 40 years at Rand. He authored uh, all sorts of amazing things, but one of the things I wanna talk about is the Ware Report, which was a foundational report in US computer history. It set a lot of tone for computer security. Um, the dude was brilliant. Um, uh, with that understanding of the importance of computers, he was also one of the first people to point out that Computers were going to have a profound impact on privacy, and for the couple of us old enough, 1974, the U.S. government pretended to care about our privacy, uh, and we got a pri the first Privacy Act in the U.S., and it was because he pushed the Ford administration to create a Privacy Act. Um, the Ware Report is dated. It was um, 1967 to 70 or 71. Um, it has the official title, uh, the sexy title, Security Controls for Computer Systems. Um, but it's an interesting report because even though it's obsolete, it's not obsolete. Um, certainly security controls will be cheapest if it is considered in the system architecture prior to hardware and software design. We've, lear we've learned this message, right? He told us this in 1967. Um, <laughs> user convenience is an important aspect of achieving security control because it determines whether or not users tend to find ways to get around, ignore, or circumvent controls. <laughs> huh, it turns out people are just trying to do their jobs and uh, we should not stop them from doing their jobs. Crazy talk, I know, right? Um, 1967. Uh, oh, completely obsolete diagram. There's nothing here that applies today unless you change a couple of labels and update a couple of clip art pieces. Um, 
He's talking about whether or not you can trust couplings, cross-coupling, whether or not you can trust your hardware, whether or not you can trust your programmers, operators, trust the people that run maintenance, worry about traps of taps and radiation and crosstalk, and you know, of course, remote consoles at the time were mostly you could follow a wire. Um, but it was still an issue. And we freak out about all of these things, and you can change this up a little bit, and it can be when we freaked out about uh, client server models. What's and funny, though, is that's the radiation is the bad next freaking. Yes, yes. <laughs> it, I mean, this stuff is... Um, <laughs> then we can apply this with a little bit of change uh, to freaking out about virtual machines. We can use it for freaking out about cloud. We can use it to freak out about mobile devices. We can use this to freak out about uh, containerization and we, it's, uh, here's another dude that had some interesting thoughts, Bob Abbott. Um, uh, he was involved in a, a project called the uh, Rice House Report, Research into Secure Operating Systems. But he's also, a, he was also a really cool dude. Um, arguably the first security consultant, first person to make a practice of security outside of being, working for the government. Um, <clears throat> what do these make sense here? Oh, uh, he created the first confidentiality uh, <coughs> rules for uh, healthcare, created the first Cray class uh, supercomputer OS that went into 24 by 7 by 365 uh, operation. Um, he led a project that did the first uh, physiological monitoring system for uh, open heart surgery patients. Um, he, what I hope all of you have seen the movie Sneakers, um, he was the technical consultant to it. What isn't known unless you, he was at NSA, it's not what you would call a red team today, but he led the first red team thing at NSA, the first defensive security unit, which later became the pit, which folks like Ron Gula and uh, Jeff Mann and others were involved in, but before them, they, this dude had a team that tested if things were secure. That team is represented in the movie Sneakers. Every one of those people in that team represents somebody that Bob Abbott hired and trained and was part of his team. You know, there was, there was literary license taken. Um, the NSA dude, which was played by James Earl Jones, was named Bernard Abbott as a nod to Bob Abbott, the, um, the technical guy in this. Um, Again, because once again, there's an old white dude who happens to be straight and cisgender on, in front of you all. I'm going to point out a woman of color from the Deep South. We have an African-American gentleman in the 60s and 70s that were defining figures in our industry, foundational figures. Um, I feel awkward pointing these things out, but it needs to be said. Our industry is not just about people who look like me, and nor should it, should it be. Um, yeah, enough, enough uh, uh, preaching, Jack, enough preaching. Uh, so anyway, he did this report, security analysis, blah, blah, blah. This one doesn't age as well, um, but there are some interesting things in this report that are worth taking a look at. If you're really into the history, it's worth reading. A lot of it doesn't age near as well as the wear, wear report, but it's a lot more specific. <clears throat> this document will be especially useful if it reduces the current tendency for the same security flaw to reappear repeatedly in different systems. <laughs> uh, how'd that work out for us? Well, um, they came up with seven key flaws in operating systems that we needed to address. And first, I have to say, remember, um, <laughs> it's easier to define a problem than fix it most of the time. But if you don't define it well, you're not going to fix it well, right? Um, anybody that's ever worked support, you've had the thing where the customer tells you what it is they're trying to do, and you spend hours, days, weeks, or months trying to do that, when if you had said, no, time out. What are you trying to accomplish? Don't tell me what you're trying to do with this thing. What is, the end, what is it you're trying to make happen? And I remember one when I was doing firewall support a long time ago, like, I want to do this and this, and I was like, you know, the reason we tell you to update is because that's been a feature request for years and that's a checkbox now. Would you please update your software and then check the checkbox? Um, so anyway, easier to define, but incomplete parameter validation. Huh, yeah, we got that nailed. Um, inconsistent parameter validation. Uh, I know what it means. To, why would you do that? Um, 
We don't handle privilege to date. Uh, all right, maybe we haven't fixed this one. Um, early 70s, race conditions and time to check out, time to use. That's gotten easier, right, now that we have like 85 cores in every box, because you have a quad or eight core processor, but then you've got how many processors on the video card, and then every other thing has a processor. There's no chance of us having race conditions, is there? Um, <laughs> When the video card processes at orders of magnitude faster than your CPU, there's no chance of stuff going sideways, is there? Uh, huh. Oh, thankfully though, identification, authentication, and authorization. We got this one nailed, right? This is good. <laughs> this is so solved. Um, we still fight the battle of trying to get people to understand those are three different things that are interrelated, right? It's like, wait. Uh, uh, we said, prohibitions that don't really prohibit. And then uh, Jim's favorite in the web world, logic errors, uh, exploitable logic errors. It's like, I want it to do this. Well, it's gonna do what you tell it. Um, so anyway, that kind of makes you feel this way. But what I wanna point out is at the OS level, we really have moved way forward. We've moved you know, a lot of this up into the application level and that's not good, but we've actually hardened things. Here's, uh, there's a reason if you come up with an exploit that will um, pop my iPhone X, you know, if you, you come up with a remote code execution on, an I on a modern iOS device, you retire. It's worth a lot of money because you have to chain together a whole bunch of fiddly stuff to even have a chance at it. So we've gotten better. Now we have moved it up the stack and People just do the dumbest stuff possible, but we'll get to that too. So anyway, uh, let's talk about another dude, uh, Jim Anderson. What am I doing on time? I'm just dabbling away. Um, Anderson uh, was, like a lot of these guys, came out of the war. He was a meteorologist, gunnery and radio officer, InfoSec pioneer. Um, he created the, uh, the idea of the reference monitor. He created uh, log analysis-based uh, um, intrusion detection. So basically passive intrusion detection based on logs um, decades ago. Uh, he was a contributor to the Ware Report. Uh, follow on, the Anderson Report defined Air Force security and uh, Air Force to this day tends to lead the way in military security, cyber security. Uh, they're the ones that started using cyber uh, different than the way most of us used cyber a few decades ago. Um, and so the Anderson Report was cool. He uh, then was involved in the Rainbow Series, especially the Orange Book. Uh, we'll get to that. Um, I want to read a quote. Uh, Gene Spafford. Spaff has become a, a dear friend over the years, and he hates it when I call him an InfoSec historian because he did a bunch of really, he's done a bunch of amazing stuff himself. But um, when I dig into history, uh, I often read obituaries and tributes that he's written for early figures. So I want to read a, a chunk of Spaff's tribute to Anderson. Anderson had broad interests, deep concerns, great insight, and a rare willingness to operate out of the spotlight. His sense of humor and patience with those earnestly seeking knowledge were greatly admired, as were his candid responses to the clueless and self-important. He eschewed public recognition of his many accomplishments, preferring that his work speak for itself. Let me back up, just read. His sense of humor and patience with those earnestly seeking knowledge were greatly admired. There's a lesson that every one of us should take. Uh, be patient with people who are trying to learn. Because um, we're at HackerCon, we get to talk about this. And I'm not going to say anything bad about any, air quotes, reformed hackers. Some of them have made a real name for themselves and continue to and make a lot of money. Um, but this guy is somebody that I don't think we understand well enough. I mean, Kevin Polson is an amazing journalist and he digs into things. Uh, there's that other Kevin guy. Um, uh, and he's actually doing some really cool stuff with training now. He's, um, he's also really good at self-promotion. Um, but Robert T. Morris, the Morris worm. Um, this was a significant point in history for computer security in the US and globally. Uh, he's why we have a cert. The Morris worm got out and that was like, hey, we need to be able to do something with this. SPAF actually did the forensic analysis of it. Well, why would you do forensic analysis of something that you have the code to? 
Well, because it didn't work the way he expected, and it got out, and it raised hell. Uh, so we had to figure out why things happened, and SPAF led that, and that led to the creation of the CERT. Um, first person convicted under the good old CFAA, possibly the last one justly convicted. No. Um, charged in 89, sentenced to three years probation in 90, appealed. They didn't find that appealing. Uh, served his probation. And that's all most people know about him if they know that much. He went on to co-found a couple of companies. One of them was ViaWeb. The other company he co-founded is Y Combinator. That's kind of a thing to this day. He's changed the nature of technology through co-founding Y Combinator and incubating, I don't know how many thousands of companies, maybe some that some of us have worked for. Um, then he kind of got out of the entrepreneurial space. He's closing his 12th or 13th year as a tenured professor of CS and EE at MIT. He's been at MIT, I forget how long now, but almost 20 years, but he's been a tenured professor of CS and EE at MIT. He's making a difference for generations to come through what he's done. And most people just know him as the Morris Worm guy. And he doesn't want to talk about any of it for obvious reasons. Cool dude. If I'm talking about him, I do have to talk about his dad who was... His dad was cool in his own right. Uh, he was at Bell Labs uh, back when that was a thing. Um, he worked on Multics. He was involved in that newfangled Unix stuff when people pivoted from Multics to Unix. Um, he spent uh, 86 to 94 at NSA. That meant he was at NSA when his kid did that thing. And the FBI had to come in and sit down with him. And I have talked to people that were there that day. And they had to escort the FBI in. And they said it was a really kind of fun ego thing because the FBI guys go in as FBI agents. And you get to the gates at Fort Meade, FBI agent doesn't mean anything at all. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, so <laughs> they had to be escorted into a, uh, you know, a secure area that was safe for non cleared people because baseline clearance at the fort is above what most people at the Bureau ever can achieve, um, and it's highly compartmentalized. But anyway, they had to say, oh, by the way, we're rolling up your kid today. Uh, it was a fairly awkward thing. Uh, he used to go out and he chain smoked, and uh, he would always throw his cigarettes out in the same place outside his office and burned the uh, bark mulch and burned up shrubberies. That's one of the stories of... Uh, Robert Morris. Um, he had some interesting quotes. Uh, first, never under, <laughs> thankfully this is no longer true. Never underestimate the attention, risk, money, and time that an opponent will put into reading traffic. <laughs> oh, right. Um, he had uh, cryptanalysis. Oh, back to, uh, back to uh, Turing and uh, the Bomba. Rule number one of cryptanalysis, check for plain text. I'm sure none of you have ever been doing a capture the flag and couldn't break a code and then realized part of it was plain text to screw with you. That's, <laughs> that's like, wait, oh shit, I should just read this. Uh, <laughs> and he had three golden rules to ensure computer security. Now let's put this in perspective. Bell Labs, Multics, Unix, NSA. Three golden rules of computer security. Don't own a computer. If you own one, do not power it on. If you must power it on, don't actually use it. <laughs> um, so there's this uh, phrase that people like to kick around that's, uh, I hate, and it makes me get ragey, and it's responsible, no, it's not responsible disclosure. I hate that one, but that's a whole nother rant. Um, there's the term ethical hacker. There's even a certification. Um, and that implies that hacker needs this qualifier. Um, and that's, um, pardon my jack-speak fucking bullshit. Um, we push boundaries, right? You, you wanna, if you come up with loose enough definitions, hot rodders are hackers because we push the boundaries of cars. Does uh, make the car go faster, stop faster, and corner harder until you crash, then fix it so that that doesn't happen again, and push it until you crash again and repeat and repeat? That doesn't sound anything like what we do with Raspberry Pis, our badges, and everything else, right? But uh, this dude, Rene Carmeil, uh, if you want to call somebody an ethical hacker, maybe we can put that on him. He was a punch card computer expert uh, before what we call computers today, but in the 30s and 40s. Um, one of the foremost people, he probably knew more about the punch card systems that IBM made than IBM did. Um, he was the census in France. 
he cooperated with the Vichy government. Um, sort of. He was a member of the resistance, uh, sabotaged the Nazi census of France for many years during the war. He saved literally untold hundreds, if not thousands of lives. We can't tell because he sabotaged the census. Um, nobody understood the system as well as he did, and so he made sure that people disappeared from the system, people weren't counted, uh, demographic data, things like that weren't, um, weren't available, saved a lot of people. Uh, and he lived happily ever after. But no, that's not what happened. Uh, he was arrested, imprisoned, and died at Dachau for saving thousands of lives as an ethical hacker. Uh, the folks that I've talked about here and at least 100 more on a project of mine called The Shoulders of InfoSec, it's a horrible wiki. Um, but to take a look, I've done some talks that are nothing but this stuff, these historical figures. Um, if you take a look there and see somebody missing, uh, let me know. If you have any personal anecdotes about anybody there or people that should be there, let me know. Um, this summer, I hope to start filling in more of the hacker history, and sometime in the next year or so, I want to start bringing the next generation of people in. Uh, there is a sec segment on uh, web app sec that's got some younger people. I actually like doing that one because I didn't have to look for dead people. I didn't like that one because uh, like two of the people on do web app sec are older than me and everybody else is a child. But anyway, um, comments, rec recollections, whatever. So uh, computer security. Let's come forward a little bit um, to the, within the past decade or so and look at some of the things we've learned. Uh, MITRE, <coughs> any MITRE employees here? Okay, I get to say this then. I, I have a lot of friends at MITRE and some new, f some friends that have just joined MITRE. And um, I like to tell them that I'm so old, I remember when MITRE was relevant. Uh, <coughs> uh, they're actually doing some cool stuff again, but they're, they're not what they used to be. But anyway, they did this interesting report, um, uh, 2010, Science of Cybersecurity. And they're trying to put some scientific rigor into what we do. And um, <laughs> the most important attributes would be the construction of a common language and set of basic concepts that the security community can use for a shared understanding. Ask somebody what the difference between a threat and vulnerability and exploit and we're done, right? You know, what do you mean by machine learning versus artificial intelligence? We're not there. We need to get there if we're going to do this. Um, yeah. Precise definitions matter until there's a precise set of objects that can be examined carefully and clearly it won't be possible to increase the level of rigor. Um, science, scientists have like words that mean shit and they mean the same thing every time they use them. Wouldn't that be amazing for us? Um, <clears throat> you don't have to read this one. Hmm? What would marketing do? Buy us drinks. Just shut up and buy us drinks. That's what marketing is there for. Uh, <laughs> um, this and the blob that's there. Here's the challenge. How much value, let's, let's make the old timers twitch. How much value is my knowledge of uh, WINS replication on NT4 today? A couple of you are like, oh, he said WINS replication. Um, how much value is my knowledge of securing IIS4 or Exchange 5.5? Five five? It's worth a lot now to companies who still use it. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's like it's COBOL. Aged, it's aged so much. That yeah, it's like, it's like COBOL. Uh, but there's only a couple of people that need that, right? But the thing is, you've got to patch your systems today. You have to spend time hardening sh systems that, you know, are getting better. We have to address the immediate concerns, otherwise we're screwed. But every minute that we spend focusing on bandaging our systems, we're not addressing the underlying security issues. And so people in academia like to focus on some of these big picture ideas and they don't work with us and they don't always get it and so they come up with ideas that aren't really practical. And we're, we're making some progress on this, but we have this challenge where we need, some, we need more fundamental understanding of things. We need more fundamental understanding of how to teach people how to code well. We need people to understand the implications of what they do, but we gotta patch our shit. Uh, you've got to find holes in shit that people haven't patched so that they can patch it so we can move forward. And so we have this split. A lot of the work we do is ephemeral. It kind of goes away. Uh, I have to do it today, but it's, uh, it's a real challenge. And it's one of the battles that we've fought basically forever. Um, and that's not to be depressing. It's just a reality that 
whenever we can pause and, and think about whether or not our big picture idea is actually going to be practical or whether or not um, there's somebody working on big picture ideas that we can talk to, um, that's an important thing. Um, so in science, they've talked about a variety of things like guidance from other sciences like economics. Um, we can get into a whole thing as to whether or not economics is a science um, or a dark art. Meteorology, that's an interesting one here in uh, the pointy end of Florida because it turns out that meteorology is kind of important down here. And I live on the coast of Georgia where uh, meteorology is kind of important too. I had to evacuate for Hurricane Irma last year. Um, and it's still imprecise, but we're getting better. I mean, the, the hurricane prediction stuff now, what NOAA does with hurricane prediction stuff is amazing. It's imprecise, but it saves lives. There's, there's a model for us, imprecise, but saves some stuff. Uh, medicine, well, we've got this intersection of medicine and technology now that we're all starting to get a little uh, freaked out about. Astronomy, agriculture, immunology. This one's my favorite one, and people talk about learning from biologic sciences. And there's a lot of lessons to be learned there. Like when we patch, we help build herd immunity because if my systems don't get popped, um, then I'm not going to become a pivot point to attack your systems. But there's something you need to remember. For a species to be biologically successful, it can make a lot of mistakes and end up with one organism left that can cut itself in half and make two organisms or uh, one breeding pair and then rebuild having figured out what's going to work for long-term survival. Um, does everybody but one of you in the room want to go back to your organization and say, in the long run it's going to be better, but we're all unemployed because we're going to be one of the casualties of uh, na natural cyber selection. Uh, so be careful when you... <laughs> um, so we know we need to break or bridge silos. We need language and test beds. Self-defending hardware and software is actually a thing that's real now in some levels. You think about what, um, not to plug them because they're a little weird, but Bromium and now Microsoft is pulling that in. We have processors that are powerful enough to do like kernel level micro virtualization and we can have a reference monitor on one core in some things. We can, it's like, this is what it looks like. How come the shit that's running doesn't look like that anymore? What should we do about it? There are things that we can finally do. There's stuff that people like Random proposed, but were not possible. The stuff that SPAF and some of those that weren't possible. Now we have the processors. Now, of course, we run Slack and Chrome, and therefore we have no memory left, no matter how much we put in our computer. <laughs> but um, <laughs> you know, but it's it's theoretically possible. Let's pull another guy in, Steve Lipner. Um, not originally a security specialist. He was into computers, and he landed at MITRE a very long time ago, and they put him on uh, computer security. And he said he didn't like doing computer security, he wanted nothing to do with it. But because he was a young guy and wanting to be you know, helpful, he said, I'm only going to do this until they hire the right person. And he's like 50 years into his career, and he hasn't stopped yet. So uh, yeah, he was at MITRE, he went on to DEC, he went to Microsoft, uh, he was instrumental in the Orange Book, uh, instrumental in Microsoft Trustworthy Computing. Uh, he's one of the people that made Trustworthy Computing a thing at Microsoft. Uh, he retired from Microsoft a few years ago. He's doing consulting now. Interest, if you're really into this history stuff, he wrote, um, you have to be an IEEE member or know somebody who will slide you a copy of this, The Birth and Death of the Orange Book. He's one of the people that's taken a hard look at why the Orange Book was a failure. And a lot of people don't like to say it was a failure. But um, basically the, the strict security controls and not taking the usability and user stuff into account made it a failure. Um, so that's an interesting take if you're into this. Uh, his quote was, um, if the objective of the Orange Book and uh, NCSC was to create a rich supply of high assurance systems that incorporated mandatory security controls, it's hard to find the result was anything but a failure. Um, set the precedent for government evaluation of commercial products, which was cool, but it undoubtedly raised vendors awareness. That was cool. Um, however, it sent people down dead ends and wasted decades and hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars on things that weren't practical and would never be uh, purchased in the wild. So it was, a, it was a waste. So back to this thing. Um, let's talk about it. Then computers were rare and ridiculously expensive. The people that did them were clerical. Um, in the early days of computing, it was uh, it was clerical and women did it for 78 cents on the dollar or whatever it was back then. Um, 
You know, Grace Hopper is in my longer talks, as she should be. They programmed computers with patch cables. When they started making things with dip switches instead of patch cables, that dramatically sped up the process of computing. Wrote the first compiler. Um, but people were readily available and cheap. Computers were rare and expensive. Computers are now free. I know you will argue, but to a certain, I need to do a thing. The thing needs to, like, I don't know, toast bread in the morning. I'm gonna run a full stack Linux thing, well, BusyBox, which compared to what we considered full stack 10 years ago is a full stack. Um, I'm gonna put that in my toaster because everybody can do this and there are all sorts of toolkits and there are all sorts of toolkits and uh, so that's the way to do it. We're just gonna run a computer. We're not gonna run QNX or anything light. We're not gonna run an ASIC. Those are expensive and custom. We're gonna put a processor with an OS on it to do every little thing and that's how we do everything. Um, People that understand that, um, the whole skills gap is a whole nother conversation, but we need more people in this room and working with us. I, don't, I think all of us would agree, none of us work with a large enough team of well-trained and uh, well-adapted people. Um, so it's interesting, because now the people are rare and expensive, the computers are cheap, big shift in time. Um, Things that happened here. We started consumerization of hardware, right? When we started consumerization of hardware, it started to be commoditized because people like paid how much for a TRS-80 or whatever, you know, and it didn't do that much. And then business computers, there started to be pressure to put personal computers in business. Um, but we consumerized it. One of my favorite stories is one of Marcus Random's stories. He went into a bank said they were putting a new ATM system in, their first. They, he consulted and they said, what should we do with it? It's like, it needs to do like a handful of things. You should run QNX, it's rock solid, it'll run for decades, you don't have to worry about it at all. And they said, well, what about running NT4? And he's like, on an ATM, are you out of your mind? Yeah. And they said, well, we're thinking we want to run NT4. He's like, no, you want to run QNX. You don't want to run a, an insecure desktop operating system, even though it's not connected. Oh, that's another thing we started doing here, right? Global interconnectivity. That's kind of an interesting thing that challenged it. They said, but our graphic guy made a splash page for the ATM that we want to use, and he did it in PowerPoint. So we need an operating system that will run Microsoft PowerPoint Viewer. And so they ran NT4 Workstation with PowerPoint Viewer on it, and their ATMs, and Marcus left and never consulted for them again. Um, <laughs> So in this process from very simple to ridiculously complicated systems, right? How many computers are in your computer? How many processors? We can't even count. There are processors on your memory devices. There are processors on video. Um, somewhere back in here, as a CS student, you had a project which was tell me everything that happens on the computer in a five second or 10 second window. You can't even tell me everything that happens in one of your video cards in a five second window right now. Um, the complexity has just exploded. Um, there's no such thing as a computer. Everything's a computer. Like I, sometimes I don't take my laptop, I, so I don't travel with a computer. Well, unless you count an iPhone X with a quad core 64 bit processor faster than the last top, your company issued you, uh, and the bus speed is faster than your last laptop. And let's not talk about my LTE-enabled multi-radio watch. Um, but I don't travel with a computer. <laughs> yeah. The world's gotten a little more tr uh, challenging. Um, in the old days, it was all about crypto and confidentiality, um, availability. Integrity starts to be a thing when everything's over the wire, right? Ask the North Koreans or the Iranians what happens when you're not sure you trust a system. Um, and now that we don't trust, oh, but we can't trust systems. We have to let systems make decisions for us and we simply have to trust them because we can't unwind things fast enough to figure out why they do what they do. One of the things that happened in this consumerization and commoditization thing, which is part of our problem, but it's also a why we have an internet that connects the world. We consumerized software and we consumerized the creation of software. So you didn't have to be a developer. And this is one, I'm gonna bet you've had this conversation, Jim. Oh, I just do websites, I'm not a developer. 
<laughs> right, right. D what what do you use? Well, I mean, I, I I used to do a lot of SQL, but now I I do you know Mongo and stuff. But I, and I'm just I'm just doing websites. It's like, c can you make anything happen with CSS reliably? Yes. Okay, you're a fucking developer, <laughs> right? So we've consumerized software and the development of software, which is interesting. We've automated things uh, to a point that's crazy. Um, huh, that's added some stress, which goes back to me, take care of yourself and the people around you. Um, in here, hackers got involved and we broke the orange book. Loft told us things um, in the mid 90s, uh, what were the names? The Comsec, arguably the first hacker based uh, pen test company. A couple of years later, Loft pivoted in 2000 to be at stake. And then this crowd's people, Weld and Dill and Space Rogue and whatever, started putting pressure on the industry because we came at it from outside of that government model. We weren't on the same train they were. Uh, hacker cons brought us together and we started sharing information. Um, like we're doing today, right? Started sharing information. Um, so what's the future hold? Um, I don't know, I'm not a futurist. Uh, Douglas Adams quote, I love this. I often in talks with this. When I'm supposed to say something brilliant about the future and can't, I really didn't foresee the internet, but neither did the computer industry. Not that that tells us very much, because the computer industry didn't even foresee that the century was going to end. <laughs> Hopefully by 2038, I'm not still doing this. Because um, I'll let the young ones here deal with 2038. Um, hmm. <laughs> oh, by the way, speaking of year Y2K, uh, this is one of the things that I just, I hate. Uh, Rudy Giuliani, you idiot. Um, Y2K wasn't a hoax. Y2K was a nothing burger because uh, a lot of us made it that. We busted our ass, we fixed things, we replaced systems, we patched systems, we tested systems, we went to work on New Year's Day, and things worked, and then we went back home with a deep sigh of relief and got good and drunk uh, again. Um, I don't think we stopped drinking. Yeah, no, we, we didn't. Yeah. Um, So the future, I don't know. I really don't know. Everything old's new again. You know, we've containerized things, but is that just, you know, what's an asset? I, the world I work in, what's an asset? Is that an application? Is it a computer? Is it? But it all applies, and we've got all of these little devices that are unsecure and unsecurable. We're back to Windows 98, where all of the obsolete network analysis matters again, because it's the only way to know what's going on. Agents matter again, because if you're in a containerized environment, you better put an agent on things so when they spin up, you can track them and know what they're doing. Um, I would just encourage you to, before we freak out about the next new thing, try to remember if there's a lesson we've already learned from it, um, and apply the lesson and then tweak it to change whatever is different. The lessons of moving from mainframe to client server apply as we move into a more containerized and DevOpsy world, not completely, but let's not start over every single time. Um, so the future. Uh, I'm supposed to say something really important here. Um, and this is it. We have to do it together. I don't know what the future is going to look like, but if we don't work together better, we're screwed because we're going to keep working alone. Um, and with that, that is the end of my talk, but it's not the end of the day. It's not the end of what I'm trying to get through to you. It's the beginning. There's a lot more good talks. There are a lot more good conversations. There are friends to make. There are networking to do. And uh, yeah, thanks. That's, that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. <laughs>